Welcome back to Disturbed Reality. Servando Gomez Martinez. Some would describe him as the real life Walter White. Though, unlike the TV show, reality is often far more brutal than fiction. Servando Gomez Martinez, born on February the 6th, 1966, in Artega, Michoacan. Though, not much is known about his early life or upbringing. It's said that he was an academic, who was articulate and blessed with charisma and the ability to control a room and capture attention whenever he spoke. Servando would put his skills to good use, where he would study and eventually become a teacher, where he taught students all throughout Michoacan. This would later earn Servando Gomez Martinez the nickname of La Tuta, or in English, the teacher. He would also be referred to as El Profe, or the professor. It's believed that Servando began teaching in the 80s, and it seemed, on the surface at least, that he had a long and rewarding career ahead of him. It's unclear to when Servando entered the criminal underworld, but the first red flag occurred in 2001, where his brother, Luis Felipe Gomez Martinez, aka El Guicho, was arrested for drug trafficking. Francisco Javier Sotelo Barrera, aka El Pancho, a high-ranking member of La Familia Michoacana, was also identified as the nephew of Servando. Although it's unknown to when exactly Servando entered the criminal underworld, but it's said that by the mid to late 2000s, he was recruited by La Familia Michoacana, all while still working as a teacher. Originally, he was seen as the official spokesperson of La Familia, who at the time was run by El Mas Loco, the craziest one, Nazario Moreno Gonzalez, who ran the cartel as a quasi-religious organization. He would often refer to the cartel's gruesome assassinations and beheadings as divine justice. The organization would release frequent statements claiming to be the protectors of the citizens of Michoacan, and that they were against crimes such as extortion, kidnap, rape, and the murder of innocent people. Obviously, this was very contradictory, because at the same time, they were one of the largest drug cartels in Mexico. Servando was a key figure, being a vital mouthpiece to spread the organization's propaganda. He would very frequently make public press releases where he would insult and denigrate other cartels, such as in an interview conducted in 2009 with Vosway Solucion, where he would praise then Mexican president Felipe Calderon, as well as the army, and stating that his only grievance was with Los Zetas, who, at the time, were running riot in various states across Mexico. He would state that most of these Zetas were dirty drug addicts, who kill, rip, and victimize innocent people, whereas, according to him, La Familia were the opposite. He also stated that anyone within La Familia who conducted themselves in the same manner as the Zetas would be punished and made to pay. He also stated, and I quote, La Familia was created to look after the interests of our people and our family. We are a necessary evil. When asked what La Familia really wanted, Gomez replied, the only thing we want is peace and tranquility. As the years passed, pressure on La Familia would intensify due to increased scrutiny from law enforcement as well as being in various wars with rival cartels, including Los Zetas and the Old Millennio Cartel. Despite being a well-known cartel member, La Tuta was still on federal payroll for his teaching job up until December of 2010. Why such an oversight could have happened is anyone's guess. 
Was it a mere mistake, or something more nefarious? Who knows? By 2010, La Familia were starting to fall apart. Then leader, Nazario Moreno Gonzalez, was supposedly killed on the 9th of December 2010 after a police raid, though in reality, this was not actually the case. It turned out that Nazario escaped the raid and lived, and used the encounter to essentially fake his death. However, Nazario would be killed for real on the 9th of March 2014 after a shootout with the Mexican army in Michoacan. After Nazario's alleged death in 2010, there was a split among the La Familia hierarchy. Servando Gomez Martinez would decide to leave the organization and bring his close allies with him to form Los Caballeros Templarios, or the Knights Templar in English. In turn, this would weaken La Familia, and the two organizations would fight on and off for the next few years. After the official death of Nazario in 2014, La Familia were no longer the dominant organization in Michoacan. Upon the inception of the Knights Templar, Servando would implement many of the same rules and regulations that La Familia had. He would form a so-called strict code of ethics, developed by Latuta himself. The code was contained in a small book that was handed out to all members of the organization, and even to the public. The book was decorated with knights on horseback with lances and crosses. The 22-page book is titled The Code of the Knights Templar of Michoacan, and it contains the rules and regulations of the cartel. The gang based its rules on those of the European Knights Templar. Members would swear to help the poor and helpless, fight against materialism, respect women and children, not to kill for money, and not to use drugs. The Knights Templar would even go as far as drug testing all members, although the gang would delve into criminal activities. In certain cases, the rules were still upheld, and those who went against them were punished by death, usually by beheading. The merchandise of choice for the Knights Templar tended to be marijuana and methamphetamine. Latuta coordinated drug shipments through Baja California, which would head into the USA through San Diego. La Tuta's Knights Templar were also heavily involved in extortion operations in Michoacan. According to a subscriber by the name of Mary, it was common practice for La Tuta's men to collect monthly protection fees from local businesses, and those who didn't pay would be severely beaten have family members kidnapped, or even be killed. She also stated that in certain areas, businesses or citizens who wanted to build on land had to seek planning permission, not from the local government, but from the Knights Templar. They essentially acted as a quasi-unelected government in certain towns and villages, and to keep the public on side, they would regularly provide locals with clothes, food, as well as presents for children on Christmas. It's also said that Latuta, due to his former profession, would donate large sums of money to local schools. The Knights Templar were very successful in their initial years. They garnered large swathes of territory and influence in Michoacan. They would even ally with the likes of Cartel del Golfo, Cartel de Sinaloa, and the remnants of the Beltran Labor Organization. The rise of the Knights Templar Cartel in Michoacan also coincided with the then new Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generacion, aka CJNG, who were making plays across Mexico for control of various states, including Michoacan. Unsurprisingly, the two cartels would be at odds for control of the state. The conflict was also fueled by personal animosity from both cartel leaders. CJNG leader El Mencho was formerly part 
of the old Millennio Cartel in Michoacan, who fought an especially brutal war with the old La Familia organization, who would end up getting the better of the Millennio Cartel. And of course La Tuta was a former member of La Familia. The historical bad blood led to many gruesome acts of depravity, some of which were filmed and subsequently uploaded online as a warning to their rivals. The war would be ongoing for several years, but kicked into overdrive in and around 2012, all the way up until 2015 when the Knights Templar would suffer a huge blow. On February the 27th, 2015, at 3 a.m., Servando Gomez Martinez was captured. He was apprehended by an elite squadron of the Mexican Federal Police in Michoacan in an operation where no shots were fired. The police were able to spot him in a cave near Morelia after his girlfriend ordered a chocolate cake for his 49th birthday, which raised the suspicion of the authorities looking for him. At the time of his arrest, Servando Gomez Martinez was one of Mexico's most wanted drug lords. On the 11th of March 2015, he was officially charged by a federal court in Toluca for organized crime, kidnapping, and drug trafficking offenses. In June of 2019, he was sentenced to 55 years in jail for the kidnapping of a businessman in 2011. So more than likely, Servando, the real life Walter White, will die in prison. Following the arrest of La Tuta, the Knights Templar organization would fall into complete disarray. The cartel were being picked off by rival Sicarios as well as law enforcement. In a last ditch attempt, to restore the cartel's presence, its new leader, L-500, Pablo Toscano Padilla, and his lieutenant, El Cheques, Ezequiel Castaneda, organized a regional meeting with members of CJNG to form an alliance with them and to ultimately bury the hatchet. However, both men were ambushed by La Nueva Familia Michoacana Sicarios and were subsequently killed. This all but ended the Knights Templar Cartel, with the remnants joining organizations in Michoacan, such as Carteles Unidos and Cartel del Abuelo. The cartel were officially recognized as disbanded by authorities at the end of 2017. Despite their demise, however, their brutal legacy still lives on. As previously mentioned, much of the violence between CJNG and Knights Templar was unfortunately recorded on camera, though mostly by CJNG. Arguably, the most infamous clip depicts the graphic interrogation and murder of a supposed Knights Templar member, which is one of the most unique cartel clips of its kind. But nevertheless, what happens in the actual video. The video itself first appeared online on the 18th of July 2014 and was more than likely originally uploaded on mundonarco.com. It is unclear as to where the video was shot, but more than likely the crime takes place in Michoacan. The video is a longer one at 5 minutes and 19 seconds long. The first 2 minutes and 20 seconds of the video is the interrogation segment. The setting is that of a desolate room which is all white, white floor tiles and white wall paint. Two men can be seen sitting on the ground laying against the wall with their hands tied behind their backs. One of the men is wearing beige trousers with a white vest, while the other is wearing jeans with no shirt. The interrogation reveals some details. The men reveal their identities. The man wearing the white vest is named Alexander Ramirez Rosario, and the shirtless man is named Omar Gonzalez. The two men are grilled for two minutes, 
and they confirm that they work for Los Caballeros Templarios. They are asked to elaborate in regards to their roles within the organisation, though they seem sheepish to reveal their roles. It sounds like the interrogators accuse them of being Sicarios. Both men seem utterly resigned to their fate. There is no begging or pleading, but the looks on their faces tell a thousand words. At the end of the interrogation, the interrogators state that they are Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generacion, as they shout obscenities at the two men, as well as the Knights Templar. The video then jump cuts, showing a still image that says Viva Mexico as a narco corrido dedicated to CJNG starts to play. Once again, the video jump cuts, and it shows an extremely gruesome sight. The shirtless man, Omar Gonzalez, can be seen sitting on the floor, leaning against a toilet, and his entire neck and chest is covered in blood. His mouth has been gagged to stop him screaming, though you can still hear his laboured breathing over the narco corrido which has been dubbed over the video. It's hard to tell exactly what has happened to the man, but it looks like that he's been potentially stabbed in the neck. Omar seems to be convulsing, and every breath he takes seems to cause his body to jolt violently. The camera fixates on Omar for several seconds as you see the pool of blood on the white tiled floor get bigger and bigger. The video once again jump cuts and it shows that Omar has been killed by beheading. He is being dismembered as a man is cutting his left arm at the shoulder with what appears to be a large kitchen knife. As he slices around the joint, you see the layers of bright yellow fat as the flesh is being cut through. The camera pans up for a few seconds, and you see the man who is dismembering Omar. It is his compadre, Alexander. The captors forced Alexander to dismember his friend Omar, and potentially, they even made Alexander kill and behead him. As he is slicing off the arm, you can see the hesitance and fear in Alexander's motions, though he eventually dismembers the left arm. After removing the left arm, Alexander then cuts around his friend's jeans, exposing his upper thigh. He then cuts around the hip joint in an attempt to remove Omar's left leg. The blade is super sharp, and cuts through the flesh extremely quickly. Once Alexander has cut deep into the flesh, he then starts hacking, trying to get through the joint. You hear the clanking sound that the blade makes as he does this. In a matter of seconds, the left leg is almost completely severed. This leaves me with the impression that the accusation that the men were Sicarios may be true, as Alexander seems to know exactly where to cut. As the left leg is nearly dismembered, the video then ends. Following the video, I asked and looked around to see if there was potentially a longer clip available to see what happened to Alexander. Though, I had no luck. I would assume that more than likely, Alexander was also executed though, potentially, he may have been recruited into CJNG. Upon searching his name online, no articles cover the case or shed any light in regards to his fate. Needless to say, the video is extremely graphic, but the nature of the execution is hard to fathom. Imagine being in a similar life or death situation held captive by cold-blooded killers, and the only way that you may potentially survive is by dismembering your friend. It doesn't bear thinking about. I'm sure by the thumbnail, 
Many of you will be aware of this video and if you have any other information surrounding this case, please feel free to let me know. But anyway, that is the video. I hope you enjoyed it, if you can enjoy this sort of content. Once again, I would like to thank you guys for the support. We recently hit 1,000 followers on Twitch, which doesn't sound like a big deal, but it's kind of cool to me. Uh, so thank you for that. If you would like to follow my Twitch, please check the link out in the pinned comment. Also, a link to my Twitter will be there. And potentially this will be my last video before Christmas. I will try my best to get one more out before Christmas. However, if I fail to do so due to, you know, social life, things of that nature, I would like to wish you guys a happy Christmas if you celebrate it. Have fun, you know, spend time with those around you, those you love those you care for. Obviously stay safe, but relax, unwind, and enjoy yourself. I always find this time of year a time of reflection, not just, you know, from the previous year, but life in general, actually. And yeah, I just feel it's a good time to reset your batteries, analyze where you're at, and ultimately come back even stronger. And that is the plan heading into 2023. But anyway, as always, stay safe, and I'll catch you on the next one.